All right, good morning, everyone. Welcome to the National Center for Healthcare Leadership's Coffee Chat. Today's presentation titled Innovative Solutions to Healthcare Staff Shortages will highlight what we are all experiencing now, the staffing challenges facing the healthcare industry that are debilitating providers across the US. But as you'll hear, there are innovations, uh, innovative solutions to this problem. You'll hear how pre-hire assessments are revolutionary, revolutionizing staff recruitment and retention. Together with Thrive Map, Sodexo is piloting strategies that boost staff retention and enhance the hiring process. I'm glad you're joining us to discuss how we can improve talent retention rates and reduce attrition. My name is Megan Nussain. I'm the Senior Director of Communications and Development with the National Center for Healthcare Leadership. And before we get started on today's discussion, I have a few housekeeping notes. First, if you have questions or comments for the panelists, feel free to put those in the Q&A section or chat. While we're trying to uh, try and we're going to hold time for questions, um, we'll do our, and if we don't have time, we'll do our best to address them offline as well. Additionally, we're utilizing Zoom and ha have enabled the closed captioning. Should you wish to enable your own closed captioning during the event, please click the closed captioning button on the bottom of your Zoom window. Now, without further ado, I am pleased to introduce today's speakers, Brendan Privet, VP Marketing at Sodexo Seniors, and Chris Platt, co-founder and CEO of ThriveMap. Brendan and Chris, I'll hand things over to you both. You should have complete control at this time. Perfect. Thanks, Megan. I'll start this morning. Um, my name is Brendan Previtt. As she mentioned, I lead marketing for Sodexo's senior living segment. And today I'm representing some innovation work that we've been doing in our segment and with counterparts in the healthcare segment uh, on a program that we call Sodexo Accelerators. I'll use this opportunity to introduce one of our exciting partners, a company called ThriveMap. So we've got Chris here to speak about that as well. So to start, you know, at Sodexo, we are very fortunate to have a global innovation team that is based in our Paris headquarters that's charged with identifying opportunities to develop new offerings and new partnerships through what we call an open innovation system. So many of you may have heard that terminology more typically tied with software development or new technology development, but it's frankly a little bit less common in our space and more of the services industry. So we think that there's an interesting model here because our global team works hand in hand with businesses like you know, mine here in the States, but they work across the entire company and across the globe then to determine what are some of those business needs that are happening in our market and with our clients. Then we have this Paris team uh, that will help us match those needs to specific potential disruptors or new entrants in the industry who are doing new, exciting, different things that can potentially help us pilot opportunities within our segments. So we started this work by getting some input from several of our frontline operators, our sales leaders within the organization, making sure we were keeping that client voice centered at all the work that we were doing and make sure we had key needs and inputs that were popping up as unmet within the industry. That would serve as our kind of focal point and guide our, our practices going forward. For us, we selected you know, opportunities that we were making sure and we, we, we had high touch opportunities to impact the relationships of our staff with whether they're in the healthcare space, patients, or in, in my segment, residents who are living in senior living communities. And so with that high touch model, model then, we worked with a third party consulting firm uh, that's based in London, they're called Lmarks, and they helped us source these startups. So with that clear North Star and what we were looking for to help kind of solve some of these unique needs in the, in the space, in a few short weeks, Lmarks helped us identify more than 100 different applicants with very unique solutions that could help bring different ideas forward and help us to help our clients as well. From there, we, we kicked off a very cool event. So we, we hosted a live uh, and virtual, so it was both in-person and available on the web, uh, available to all of our clients and um, internal staff members, a virtual pitch day. So we, we brought in 11 finalists over from the more than 100 applicants that participated and think it was, uh, think about more like a Shark Tank live format, right? So each of these startups pitching out. What was really cool about how we set this up with Elmarks is that the audience had the opportunity to vote live action with a mechanism that, that is proprietary to Elmarks, but we we're able to look at the actual pitches, ask questions live, vote on things like applicability, the attractiveness, and really trying to ground these things in the real realities of, of, of the work that we live in and deal with every day. And so we used that process to funnel down and select three companies at Pitch Day to move forward with a live pilot process. ThriveMap 
is one of those incredibly exciting pilots who've been running the gauntlet with us ever since uh, pitch day. So over the last couple of weeks and months, you know, we, we recognize in partnership with Thrive Map that you know, we are in a human powered business. And so as such, as just Megan kicked off with her opening remarks as well, we know that labor is a top pain point. We're consistently hearing that from our client partners, whether we're talking about the senior living space or healthcare. If you think about it, open job fulfillment can be a really long process, right? It can be difficult to identify candidates. Then once you hire those candidates, get them through training, and that can all be expensive and time consuming. Occasionally, and sometimes more often than we like, that new hire might decide this isn't the right job for me. They might leave much shorter than you anticipate because it just doesn't feel like the right fit for them. This, of course, only compounds the amount of time, money, and effort that ends up getting wasted and almost like a never-ending vicious cycle. And so ThriveMap is really cool because ThriveMap provides a solution whereby a candidate can have an inside look at what their not new job will be look like before they start. And to me, this helps provide a, almost a self-fulfilling prophecy on job expectations being met. So you hear more about that from the expert coming up next, but we're really loving what we're seeing from ThriveMap and their ability to leverage data and technology to deliver some actionable ROIs for our people-oriented businesses. So with that backdrop, I'm very happy to introduce my friend Chris Platts here, the CEO of ThriveMap, to tell you a little bit more. Chris? Um, yeah, thank you, Brendan, for that uh, for that introduction. Um, wow, I, I didn't realize there were 100 companies that, that pitched and we were only one of three so i feel very privileged and uh, humbled uh by that um by that stat um so yes in terms of um what we've been doing at thrive map um we essentially have been uh, partnering with sodexo in order to create an assessment for one of their clients um and um that assessment is aiming to solve a number of challenges that they have with hiring which isn't unique to a Sodexo client. It's very much a symptom of um, the staffing industry, the healthcare industry as a whole. And a number of the key challenges that they're facing are around new hire attrition, uh, as you mentioned there, Brendan, and that um, I think I, I actually had a statistic that we shared on our social media channels of the day that 77% of nursing home facilities are grappling with moderate to high staff shortages. Um, and retention is a massive issue. Um, now, uh, over 40% of new hires in healthcare jobs in the US, 40% um, of the people that are recruited will leave in the first year. Um, that rises to 60% in year two. And I think if you were to break that statistic down, you would actually be further shocked. I, I believe that frontline hires, so entry-level hires, um, maybe um, candidates that, that haven't been in the industry before will churn an awful lot higher. In fact, our statistics show that um, kind of those frontline hires can be as high as 100% um, in terms of uh, candidates leaving in their first year. So uh, our approach and our partnership with you guys is to really help solve those challenges through designing uh, what we do, so designing uh, our assessments. What I'll just go to do then is kind of explain how we take how we do that. Um, so our approach is to and has been to work with a specific client of Sodexos, which is um, uh, called VMRC, and they are the uh, Virginia Mennonite Retirement Community. Um, we um, have been working with them to design a pre-hire assessment for all of their high volume roles. Uh, it's a dining associate role. Now, um, they have almost a kind of a revolving door of, of recruiting these positions. It's kind of an evergreen vacancy. So they're constantly hiring for these people, their hourly positions. And what they find is obviously the unique environment in, in, uh, in um, the, the retirement community means that they need to find people with the correct behaviors, the correct skills, the correct attributes to really thrive in that environment. Um, and that's not easy. And it's particularly not easy if the information you have to go off is a resume, um, which may or may not have any relevant experience. It certainly will not give you a full picture of what that candidate is really like and whether they are suited to that environment. Um, the other challenge that they grapple with is obviously candidates coming into the role with perhaps an expectation of what's uh, what it's really like. 
and the reality of that role being very different from their expectation. And in fact, our research in our recent white paper, which um, I think Megan's going to send around after the call, shows that 55% of new hires have left a role for the very reason that the um, expectation of the job was different from how it turned out to be. So they were ultimately disappointed or felt that they would have been missold a position. Our assessment that we've designed for VMRC, which actually has just gone live today, um, takes a candidate through a digital day in the life of the job. So it gets them to experience the role through a series of realistic tasks and scenarios um, that enables them to learn more about the role, but also assess them against the company's unique hiring criteria so that that site, that re retirement community can select people on their ability to do the job rather than necessarily you know, their background experience or education. So what we're doing is we're streamlining the hiring process and talk more about that uh, if you have questions. Um, but we're also aiming to really communicate to candidates what life is really like in that role, dealing with those residents, what the expectations are on you as a potential new employee there. Just want to pause if you've got any questions for me on that, Brendan, or whether you're happy for me to carry on. Yeah, no, I, I think it's great. You can continue to share more. One question that I've, I've had is you know, we've been very focused in Sodexo on the front of the labor market, right? There's a higher susceptibility to turnover there, but um, I'm myself relatively new to Sodexo. I joined the company a year ago and uh, a big career change even at my level to say, you know, do as much due diligence as you can. Um, but you never get it perfect, right? There are always surprises, sometimes good, sometimes bad. How do you think about ThriveMap's capabilities at different levels in the organization? Yeah, so our, our area of specialism, uh, specialism as an assessment um, company is very much on front line. Um, we do have assessments that are used across different levels. Um, I think the reality is the type of assessment we have aims to um, enable an organization to look past a resume. And I think for more experienced levels, particularly in healthcare where qualifications, certifications are required, I think those are really valid credentials of knowledge and experience. And I think for senior level roles, they're still gonna be important. It's still important you have that kind of resume. You might use an assessment later in the hiring process to validate perhaps the fit with the values or behavioral alignment, uh, leadership competencies, et cetera. But where most of our clients use our tool is on that frontline piece. And when we looked at the assessment market, we're fairly new. You know, we, we kind of evolved into this space in 2018 where we saw what was happening. We saw what companies were using as assessments. They were using personality assessments um, and you know, hiring managers didn't understand the outputs. Candidates didn't like them. They didn't feel like the questions were relevant. Um, they weren't capturing any data or using that data to improve their assessments because they're all fixed, you know, generic um, personality assessments. And we said, well, we think there's a real opportunity for an assessment to tell a story about the role. We feel like an assessment that is contextual to that unique environment and every workplace is different, that that will be more predictive. And, and that theory is borne out to be true. Uh, in fact, there's a lot of psychological research now um, that very much stipulates you should only develop an assessment um, in a bespoke way that's contextual to the environment because anything generic can't really apply to two different environments. It's ecologically invalid. Um, and we spotted an opportunity to make things really practical and pragmatic for hiring managers. So they would look at the report on the candidates that come through and go, oh, I can see they're better at these skills uh, and not, you know, they need developing on these areas. And that's, and that's fine. I'll, I'll use that information to make sure that um, I'm testing those areas of interview. And if we recruit them, I can then use that information to onboard them in a way that see, you know, sees them for who they are and what their development needs are. And I think using the assessment at the top of the hiring funnel, so if you imagine a funnel, gives you a number of unique advantages of this type of assessment. First of all, for frontline roles, 80% of candidates that apply won't reach the bottom of the funnel. They will bounce out of the funnel because it's taken too long from the moment they apply to a decision being made. You know, it's incredibly competitive. You're competing for entry-level roles, frontline roles. You're competing against, you know, working in Walmart 
um, which is you know emotionally probably less taxing than working in a retirement community. So you need to be quick and you need to respond quickly to the candidates that do have those abilities. And I think we're seeing companies use them at the top of the funnel because it is a consistent measure of candidate quality, but it's also communicating, reinforcing what the role is really like, which means that those companies that use it can make a hiring decision more quickly. I think that makes a lot of sense. And I just want to encourage the audience to feel free to put questions in the chat or come off mute and chime in as well, but I'll, I'll throw another one your way, Chris. Um, you know, we, as I mentioned in, in my opening remarks, we are, uh, we are a hospitality services based company, right? So we are powering human care with people, right? So we spend a lot of time talking about people and, you know, here's part of our employee value proposition you see right in our, in, in my backdrop here. We spend a lot of time thinking about the benefits of those employees and giving them fulfilling opportunities that could turn into careers, not just jobs. And so you've spoken to it a little bit here, but if you think about um, certainly the employer side benefit, it, it seems to be pretty clear in terms of this model. Talk to me a little bit more about the employee side, you know, going through that recruiting process and then onboarding. Just give us a little bit more of a, a flavor of what that looks like in Thrive Maps partnerships. Yeah, thank you. So um, I think, first of all, each assessment we design for organizations is unique and each assessment has um, a feedback mechanism built within it which has sentiment analysis and comments. So candidates will rate their experience and, and put comments and it's completely anonymized. So you get some really good, honest feedback, which is great. Um, I think each assessment therefore has a different um, rating of the candidate experience, but mostly they're very positive. And I think the comments that we like seeing are from candidates that say, this assessment made me really understand the role you know it made me learn more about the opportunity and i thank you for that and i think that works two ways so we've had candidates emailing us with certain assessments saying i didn't realize how emotionally taxing this role would be i don't want to you know i've realized this isn't the role for me but thank you so much for for showing me that before before they go into that interview process and waste their time and i think there's there's again quite a lot of research supporting this and this is why we recommend that assessments are used at the top of the hiring funnel if you use it further down the funnel so um let's say after they've been screened by a recruiter maybe even after an interview uh you get this idea of the sunk cost fallacy so the candidate has invested time well i've been to an interview you know <laughs> i've spoken to the recruiter i don't want to let them down i'll just take the job and see if it's for me and and then that's kind of the recipe for disaster where they start and go, actually, this isn't for me. So we want to use it at the top of the funnel and say, look, this is honestly, this is what it's like. It's really stressful. You're dealing with residents that can be quite demanding. You're going to be really busy at certain times, particularly on a lunch shift, <laughs> the dining associate role. Um, you have, you know, we really encourage you to build relationships with residents. This isn't a transactional type of role. And I think certain people will go, actually, I can withdraw. So they can withdraw at any point in the assessment. We'll say, thank you so much for applying. We we'll completely um, accept your decision. Um, you know, click here to confirm you'd like to withdraw. And that's saving them time and it's saving you time. And the only reason why we know that that's applicable here is uh, we did some research. So again, it's in this market report that we'll, we'll share afterwards. And we researched candidates on their experience of different assessment types. And there are lots of different types you can use. You can use our approach, which we call a realistic job assessment or a simulation, job simulation. Um, but you could also you know, give them a personality test. You can give them a situational, generic situational judgment test. You can give them a game-based test. But candidates um, didn't like a number of those solutions, particularly the ones that felt disconnected from the job you're actually asking them to do. So if you are giving them an assessment that's abstract in nature and not actually directly addressing what they're doing in the role, they are more likely to claim that the assessment is unfair. Um, they're more likely to see the assessment as biased. Um, they believe that certain assessment types, such as game-based assessments, actively disadvantage um, candidates from certain demographics, particularly older candidates is in the research. So again, our principle is always coming back to what the people in this job said um, they do what the attributes they think are important and, and the hiring managers think are important and building a realistic assessment that simulates that job and hopefully from that perspective delivering a much better candidate experience. Perfect segue. We just saw a, I saw a question come through the trap the, the chat. 
you started to hit on it, but just anything else you might cover on the question here, how does your solution balance the risk for biases? Yeah, so I think there's a number of ways that we do that. Um, first of all, it's the process involves and has involved on the program um, surveying people doing the role. So uh, we sent out a survey, a job analysis survey to a number of dining associates. And preferably that's a diverse group of people of backgrounds, experiences doing the role. And we asked them, you know, what do you spend? What are the tasks that you do in the role? So if we break it on a task by task basis, what are you actually doing? Um, and how much time are you dedicating to each of those tasks per week? And then related to those tasks, what are the attributes required to complete those tasks effectively? So you're getting essentially a big list of tasks, a big list of attributes of people in the role. So that's a bottom up view of the role by a high number of people doing the role with diverse opinions and perspectives and heuristics on that role. What we're then doing is going into a workshop with your hiring leaders, HR leaders, talent acquisition, training and development. Again, people with different lenses through which to see the role and asking them of these attributes, which are the ones that you absolutely must have in new hires and candidates. Um, and we're tying everything back to that original job analysis. So the questions and scenarios that are designed come from the tasks and scenarios and situations that candidates face daily or weekly in the role. Um, so from a bias perspective, we're really mitigating uh, away from using um, technologies such as AI, which can entrench bias. We're moving away from using anything that's abstract in nature, which can perpetuate bias. And we're getting direct to source of what are people actually doing in roles. We've got a clear audit trail saying, well, okay, if you believe that attention to detail is something that's absolutely critical in these hires, and we can see that in the role, you know, the scenarios where attention to detail are used and when entering information into a point of sale system um, or um, observing a table and noticing that some cutlery missing, that we'll design specific question scenarios that directly address the context um, of attention to detail in this specific role. And that's that's where you get to a much fairer decision of, of whether a candidate is suitable for the role or not, because we're only measuring job relevant characteristics and we're only measuring them in the context of what people actually do at work. Um, so that's, that's you know, the primary way that we address that. Of course, there are other ways in terms of doing audits of bias, et cetera, on the assessment after it has gone live. Um, but yeah, ultimately, you know, we know that this process follows the EEOC, the Equal um, Employment Opportunities Commission's process of designing assessments. We've built it really closely to that process. That's great. Thank you for whoever in the audience provided that question. The, the chat is still open for more questions. I'll, uh, I'll continue on with one, one more, not seeing any in the chat there now, Chris. Um, yeah. Earlier in your remarks, you mentioned the need to really tailor this and make it bespoke to the roles and opportunities. And I, I love that for a variety of reasons. Um, you know, at SEDEX, I've mentioned a number of times, we are a human built business. And we really spend a lot of time thinking about the journeys that folks are on, right? So in the healthcare segment, it is journeys throughout the care continuum for that patient, even in senior living, right? So it's, it's, this is this next stop in life. It's not a last stop in life. And there's all this explosion of excitement for new baby boomer residents who are coming. So we think a lot about the, the uh, end user, if you will, of our services but also our employees. And so I, I really love that you're able to speak to the benefits of this technology for the employees. And on that note, right, this ability to go tight and bespoke to have a better self-fulfilling prophecy wheel that you're creating. We have uh, we have over 400,000 employees at SEDEXO. So talk to me about scale. Scale can be exciting as a, a small startup business has opportunity to grow as someone like SEDEXO. It can also be intimidating when you've got this, this custom and tailored element to how you deliver success. Yeah, so we recognize that. And um, I think a fundamental principle that we have is that context matters. And context matters to everything in life, but particularly around behavior and how people act and, and react. And we know that no two environments are necessarily the same, but there are patterns. So I think in terms of our ability to scale with a partner of the size of Sodexo, what we would approach um, or how we would approach it would be a, along the lines of a modular basis. So let's say, for example, you have a dining associate role at VMRC 
and across Sodexo's clients, you have many other dining associate uh, positions across different communities, retirement communities, or maybe even the hospital environment. I think you would be in a situation where um, because of the work we've done on the pilot, we can shortcut some of the customization elements for those clients that give them the flexibility and the ability to completely customize the narrative, what the work environment is like, um, choose their own attributes that direct, directly relate to the job analysis that they can do on their own employees, again, ahead of, uh, ahead of deployment. And the reality is, although each environment is completely unique and the context is different, the attributes you broadly look for for those positions will be you know, within a range of 10 or 12 attributes. And I think then it would be up to that employer to conduct their job analysis, which is very simple to do. We've got software that we built called Signal to do that. In fact, we can we have a link. Uh, it's free to use uh, for anyone. Um, and, and then pull from that job analysis, then select the attributes that they require and essentially design their own assessment with complete control over that assessment narrative around those scenarios and work environment. So because of the work we've already done, we've kind of a step towards that where you could see it being then rolled out across different Sodexo clients with a view that that client has control over the customization elements of it, but we don't have to, don't have to go through the, the time consuming workshops over and over again for each individual client. And that's how we, yeah, that's, that's how we would see that scaling up. Love it. Yeah. I've got one, one last question here for you, Chris. Um, return on investment. I think you may be speaking broadly to you know, some of the success metrics you've been able to see, but also just getting this up and running. If, if you're one of the audience members who's thinking ThriveMap could help your community, your facility, how long does it take to go from this concept and ideation to implementation and then maybe speak to the broader ROI metrics that y'all are tracking and are giving you confidence in your tool? Yeah, sure. So um, we got started late on this program. Um, so I think we went from initial call or initial kind of um, job analysis through to assessment going live today, maybe three weeks. Um, roughly speaking, it would take around four weeks to design a bespoke assessment with a client. In terms of metrics, KPIs, I think there's a number of things we're looking at. So we're looking at performance metrics, ultimately. So we're not going to know those for a while, but those performance metrics would be around a reduction in new hire attrition, because candidates are obviously learning experience in the role ahead of joining. We're looking at performance of new hires, so getting a performance metric of maybe passing a training probationary period or a, a, some other objective performance metric. So what we want to do is obviously prove out the assessment is likely to select people who you know, stay longer and perform better. I think then you've got another goal, which is around operational efficiencies. So you know, looking at time to fill, uh, looking at the whole recruitment workflow and seeing where the assessment is replacing, perhaps the recruiter or hiring manager pre-screen, et cetera. Uh, and I think there's a huge amount of time to be saved in that area uh, as the assessment gets adoption. Right on time. <laughs> conscious of it uh chris brendan thank you so much for your time this morning and thank you to the audience for joining as a reminder we are we have recorded this session brendan chris any closing remarks i'll just maybe go first to you know, thank the audience for your time and attention we're really ex excited to speak to a prestigious group like nchl this morning and um, we've enjoyed the, the time Thank you. Yeah, no, no comments from me other than, yeah, thanks so much. And uh, I'm looking forward to seeing you in uh, Phoenix next week. Thank you, everyone. Have a great rest of the week and uh, early, happy early Halloween and happy Thanksgiving. <laughs> Bye. Bye.